Mercedes EQA isn't the most sophisticated small EV out there, nor does it have the longest driving range. But the Stuttgart maker is hoping that when it comes right down to it, this will be the car that customers in search of a premium alternative in this class would rather have. In so much of its product planning, Mercedes is ahead of the game. And at first glance, that also seems to be true of the company's EQ-branded EV Offensive, a lineup of models that starts with this one, the Compact EQA. But all is not quite as it seems. Amazingly, for the Compact segment, the brand hasn't yet developed the kind of bespoke EV platform that full battery models ideally need. The sort of lighter, more sophisticated structure which underpins rivals to this car from BMW, the Hyundai Group and Volkswagen Group brands too. So this EQA and its close cousin, the EQB, have to roll around on an MFA2 chassis which was never originally designed for full battery motion. It's the same platform used by the combustion-powered GLA crossover, that being the model, rather than the A-Class hatch that this EV is based around. Quite a lot of work had to go into that structure to facilitate this EQA model's extra weight, but the payoff for Mercedes lies in handsome economies of scale and a car which rolls down the same German Rastat production line as its GLA counterpart. Will it though be compromised in terms of dynamics, technology or range by this approach? Mercedes says not. Car and Driving's review, the industry's most comprehensive, will put those claims to the test. If you're one of those people who wants to transition from combustion to EV motoring to be as easy as possible, then you'll wholly approve of the simplicity in setting off here. At first glance, everything is the same as the GLA model on which this EQA is based, and that includes the column gear stalk and the start button. So is the instrument screen ahead of you, uh, although here it displays an EQ graphic replaced by a ready to start message once you uh, activate the starter but will you be ready for the way that Mercedes defines a small family EV? Not all electric vehicles spring away from rest like Usain Bolt. Uh, we would somehow expected that this rather unassuming looking Mercedes might not, but no, there is the early throttle travel linearity of an on-off switch, which means that until your right foot learns to modulate it, uh, the instrument screen's blinking yellow traction control light will be getting a thorough workout. Uh, even in the dry, as the front wheels are clouted with a substantial torque rush, which of course arrives all at once, rather than with the usual gradularity of combustion power. Mercedes reckons that once the fascination of the instant performance rush wears off, people drive an EV more smoothly and constantly than they would a combustion model. We're not at all sure that that's true, uh, but if it is, you might find yourself doing that in an EQA because adjusting to the different drive characteristics are quite easy once you get familiar with them. Um, use anything more than half throttle though as you perambulate along and the toad-like background chirrup of the traction control cutting in will be a frequent journeying companion. Uh, that's despite the fact that the amount of power being controlled here isn't actually huge. Uh, not in this volume EQA 250 model anyway, which has an asynchronous 190 horsepower electric motor mounted between the front wheels, drawing on the 66.5 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery pack that's common to all versions of this car. Uh, now that sits between the axles and forms a structural part of the chassis. Ah oh yes, the chassis. Well, virtually every other major player in the EV segment has designed one specifically for the weighty needs of an electric vehicle, and you can understand why. The 480 kilo battery pack of this one weighs as much as some entire cars, a Caterham 7 for example, but undaunted, Mercedes has placed it within the usual steel and aluminium MFA2 underpinnings which undergird all its smaller models. That platform has had to be strengthened, of course, with a specially designed frame made out of extruded sections, and that explains why an EQA, tipping the scales at nearly 2.1 tonnes, nearly half the weight of an Asian elephant, weighs about 200 kilos more than a number of its key competitors. 
you feel that extra bulk through the bends, although only when you're driving this Mercedes a lot harder than uh, most owners will really want to do. It's also evident in the slightly clumpy way that this EQA addresses uh, potholes and speed humps, although the multi-link rear suspension does its best to prevent too many of the tremors from reaching the cabin. Uh, and it provides a pleasingly fluid damping experience at higher speeds. As usual in an EV, you reach those quite rapidly in the first part of the initial acceleration sprint and rather less rapidly in the second, culminating in an 8.9 second rest to 62 uh, time, which is interestingly, when all said and done, uh, actually virtually the same as a petrol powered Mercedes GLA 200, even though the 375 Newton meter torque figure of this EQ a250 is 50% greater than that conventional model. The top speed is a bit different though. Uh, the 99 miles an hour maximum of this EV plays against 130 miles an hour for the GLA 200. Still, you won't be choosing an EQA as an autobahn burner, and if you did, uh, the burning in question would primarily be through this model's rather restricted driving range. It's WLTP rated for this EQA 250 at a best of 263 miles, in a class where better versions of comparably priced rivals regularly deliver figures well over the 300 mile mark. Uh, we'll brief you on that in greater detail in our cost of ownership section. Mercedes says that it has developed an EQA variant capable of a 500 kilometer or a 310 mile range, but that will only match and in some cases still not equal the current class standard. Still, on the positive side, uh, the prevailing range figure offered by this EQA from launch is hardly affected by the extra 65 kilos of weight of the more powerful formatic versions of this model. Uh, there are two, each gaining an extra rear axle motor and thereby creating the all-wheel drive system and usefully boosting total power to 228 horsepower for the EQA 300 formatic and to 292 horsepower for the uh, EQA 350 formatic. The top speed figure remains the same, but the rest of 62 miles an hour sprint time falls, respectively, to either 7.7 .7 seconds or 6 seconds, while brake towing capability, in the unlikely event that you actually want that in this car, jumps by a massive 150% to 1,800 kilos. If you're a fan of drive modes, well, you've hit the jackpot here because there are a prodigious number. Uh, let's start with the usual comfort, sport and eco settings of the uh, Dynamic Select system. Uh, you control these, as usual in a Mercedes, via this little silver rocker switch on the lower centre console. Uh, plus, there's an individual menu which allows you to create your own drive, steering and ESP drive parameters in the unlikely event uh, that you'd want to do that. If you're wondering what the steering column shifter paddles are for in a car like this, uh, like every EV, this has a single speed transmission of course, well the answer is that they control the level of brake regeneration, or to put it rather more simply, the amount of powertrain retardation and energy harvesting that you get to slow the car when you come off the throttle. Now, many rivals give you nothing more than a selectable on-off one-pedal drive switch for managing this, but Mercedes thinks you need more, uh, developing a fiendishly clever automatic system which the car defaults to at startup, and that's setting D, which uses sensors to recognize uh, speed limits and other traffic, plus GPS data for upcoming bends and roundabouts, applying the regenerative braking accordingly. If you want to control things yourself, pulling on the right paddle selects the D plus setting that you'll want for highway travel, in which mode uh, there's virtually no off-throttle retardation at all. Alternatively, you can pull on the left paddle and you'll get either D minus, which is medium recuperation, or D minus minus, which is high recuperation. The latter slows the car so much that you'll hardly ever have to actually use the brake pedal, except when you're coming to a complete stop. If you were to ever drive this car hard, you'll find that with D minus minus selected, approaching a corner fast and then lifting off is a bit like braking uh, and then changing down with a conventional car, just a, a lot simpler.
But of course you won't habitually be driving this Mercedes hard. Firstly, because it really isn't that sort of car. And secondly, because you're usually quite conscious of its unremarkable driving range. And thirdly, because the steering gives you very little idea of what's actually happening through the front wheels. Its light feedback is very welcome in town though, where you can plump up that range figure with a lot of starting and stopping, and where you can also enjoy the benefits of a rather tight turning circle. This EQA is a good cruiser too. It sounds obvious to say that an EV of this sort is refined. Of course it is, there's no engine. But with a few rivals in this segment, all the lack of a combustion lump up front does is to magnify your perception of the remaining tyre roar, the suspension creak and the wind noise too. Helped by a slippery drag factor of 0.28 CD, there's very little of that here. And if you stretch up to the plushest level of trim, uh, that more fluid highway ride demeanor we referenced earlier can be further improved by an adaptive damping system which uh, makes the suspension more cosseting in the dynamic select comfort mode. On any EQA, you can also add in an element of semi-autonomous driving if you pay extra for the driving assistance package, and that includes the brand's Active Distance Assist Distronic system, which works with the Mercedes Active Steering Assist setup. The Distronic feature is basically a super advanced adaptive cruise control for highway use, which deals with braking and steering, as well as regulating your distance to the car in front. In short then, there's plenty about this EQA that you might like, but whether it's enough in a class full of uber-talented rivals, we'll find out shortly. What is important though, is that with this car, the Mercedes EV journey, previously restricted to luxury segment crossovers and MPVs, has at last begun in earnest with a credible volume model. It'll be fascinating to see where it goes from here. Even if you didn't know that Mercedes hasn't started off with a clean sheet in designing this car, you might guess the fact from a glance at it. This is clearly an electric derivative of the brand's GLA compact SUV, although the front and the rear sections have been restyled to fit in with the company's current EQ vehicle design language. A little disappointingly, it's all quite a long way from the rather futuristic uh, concept EQA show car of 2017, which was supposed to prepare us for what a small battery powered Mercedes might look like. As a piece of pavement theatre, this design is rather less ambitious, although there are some nice touches here at the front, uh, like this continuous light strip just across the nose, below the line of this clamshell bonnet, uh, which either side uh, connects into further fibre optic strips, which run across the blue-tinged eyebrows of these LED high-performance headlamps here. Uh, here's yet another EV, which has a blanked-off grille. It's not the prettiest design flourish, Although if you can stretch beyond this entry level sport level of trim, it does look a bit nicer with the uh, twin blade chrome strips that feature on various AMG line models, which also get a smarter looking lower bumper section. The rear sees the LED tail lamps merging seamlessly into this tapered LED light strip. The intention being to replicate the look of the larger EQC and to underline an impression of width. Unlike on the GLA, the number plate sits in the bumper, which again is redesigned for the plusher AMG line trim levels and either way features this chrome embellishment. And in profile, is this really progressive luxury in its sportiest form, as the brand's chief designer, Gordon Wagner, suggests? Well, the chunky, boxy shape of the GLA, which reappears almost unaltered here, doesn't really suggest that. Uh, EQA badges at the base of the A-pillars and unique wheel designs, uh, starting with these 18 inches and ranging up to 20 inches in size, depending on trim. They're the only real changes over that conventional model. Like that car, you get the usual SUV styling touches, silver roof rails and these squared off wheel arches with protective cladding. Under the skin, the GLA's high strength steel and aluminium MFA2 platform needed a good deal of re-engineering to take the extra weight of this EQA's battery system, nearly half a ton. Uh, the lithium-ion cell pack is mounted within a raised section of uh, the rear floor and much of it uh, sits beneath the back seat. Okay, time to check out cabin design, usually a strong point with small Mercedes models. Uh, this tall roof line allows for a notably raised hit point, which uh, for older owners will ease getting in and out. 
let's get behind the wheel, on the way to which the door shuts with a quality thunk. Uh, Mercedes didn't really need to redesign the GLA's cabin for this car, and it hasn't, uh, not at first glance anyway. Delve into different display options available across the usual glitzy screen fest, common to more models from the mark these days, and you'll find some EV specific stuff. A right hand rev counter replaced by a power and charge percentage meter, and a center screen that, as with the GLA 250E plug in model, gains an extra EQ menu, including pretty much everything you'll need to know about driving and using this car. Uh, charging options, consumption info, and a superbly detailed energy flow monitor, which uh, shows you a powertrain operation in real time. As for changes beyond that, well, we'd expected a few trimming differences to designate this EQA's BEV remit, but no, nothing, which means that this uh, model's supposed SUV status, not particularly obvious from the outside, is more evident within, thanks to a seating position 140 millimeters higher than it would be in an A-Class. If you don't happen to like that, a wide-ranging height adjuster allows you to reposition the seat so that your windscreen perspective is a bit more conventional. Look around, and for those not familiar with either the current GLA or the prevailing Mercedes take on cabin design, there's plenty to take in. Uh, take, for example, the tubular profile of the silver door grab handles that run horizontally like railings across the door center panels, and they flow seamlessly into the armrests and five round air vents, uh, these three central ones particularly prominent, all fashioned in a turbine design with filigree guide vanes that can be configured by the standard 64 color ambient lighting system to glow like jet afterburners at night. Uh, luxury downsizers will love all this, particularly if they've recently emerged from the plasticky confines of a Volkswagen ID3 or ID4. So, all very smart, but as in any other current compact Mercedes, the main passenger talking point will revolve around an array of touchscreens that look like something from an electrical store shop window. The EQA gets the premier size of widescreen layout from the brand's cabin portfolio for smaller models, and that sees a colorful 10.25 inch center dash infotainment display paired with an instrument binnacle, uh, which is the same size. There are plenty of ways to interact with this advanced MBUX or Mercedes-Benz user experience setup, a touchscreen, voice control, and various touch pads, so we'll talk you through it. Let's start with this center stack display, your portal not only for interacting with that EQ menu, but also with all of the infotainment system's expected features, uh, phone, navigation, radio, media, and so on. There are sections for Wi-Fi connectivity and apps, allowing you to access everything from a web browser to info on weather, restaurants, and hotels. And if you scroll down further, then you'll access some of this screen's various so-called themes, trip, efficiency, and lounge, or you can configure your own, which combine preset uh, layout and color styles so you can quickly change the cabin ambiance to suit your mood. Uh, plus, you can scroll through a wide selection of informational screens which feature wondrous graphics. Overall, there's much to support the brand's claim uh, that this MBUX package takes in-car connectivity to a new level. And with the EQA, unlike with the base spec GLA, the setup Rodicos range incorporates the brand's smartphone integration package, and that gives you Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring. Also standard across the lineup is an impressive 3D hard disk navigation setup, incorporating what Mercedes calls electric intelligence. And this always calculates the route that'll get you to your destination fastest, and it takes into account uh, charging times, and it allows for route topography, traffic conditions, and the weather. On the plushest variants, navigation is embellished with what Mercedes calls augmented reality technology. That's effectively a live camera feed of the road ahead, overlaid with house numbers, road names, uh, direction arrows, and other useful bits of information which will help you to find your way. Uh, the MBUX system also includes a very good voice control setup, and that's activated by the phrase, Hey Mercedes. What do you want to do? 
If you can't be bothered with voice control and you don't want to stab away at the touch screen, then you'll need to get very familiar with the various manual touch pads, which offer a further way uh, to activate this infotainment system. Uh, the main one being down here at the base of the center stack. This offers a kind of useful functionality that you'd have to do without in a rival Audi Q4 e-tron or a Volkswagen ID4. Now, usually we don't especially like touchpad controllers uh, on the move. They're rather difficult to accurately use on anything but smooth surfaces. But this particular one is the best of its kind with easy functionality helped by these surrounding shortcut buttons for key vehicle features. Two more touch pads also feature, both much smaller, and both here on the three-spoke multifunction steering wheel. The first on the left-hand spoke, offering yet another way of fiddling with the features on the screen in the center of the dash. Uh, the little touch pad on the right-hand steering wheel spoke, this is for customizing what you can see in the digital instrument display in the binnacle ahead. Flick on that right-hand touchpad and you'll bring up a horizontal menu for tailoring this instrument binnacle monitor's center section with selectable drive assistance, uh, telephone, navigation, trip, radio, media, uh, screen setup and service features. Instrument screens of this kind these days can usually be customized to show different layouts, although there aren't so many of those here. You can use this little pad to bring up a full screen display with drive assistance graphic, but otherwise everything's based around a layout with a central info section flanked by two virtual dials, all of it configurable. If you don't want the left-hand dial to show a speedometer, uh, then the space can be occupied by audio, trip itinerary, or trip computer info. And the right-hand dial, uh, usually occupied by that power and charge percentage meter that we mentioned earlier on, uh, that can alternatively show a consumption screen, an eco display as well, a nav map, or the drive assistance info, which can also be shown between the dials. You can tailor the color and style layout of both the center stack touchscreen media display and this digital instrument display via four available styles and display options. Uh, there's blue themed classic, there's yellow themed sport, uh, orange themed progressive, and there's dark minimalistic understated. Got all that? Good. Enough on connectivity, what else do you need to know about this cabin? Well, as ever in a Mercedes, you're surrounded by premium touches, which are common to every EQA variant. A glossy piano black coated center console that flows up into the dash, a leather trimmed multifunction steering wheel, a comfort spec heated seats stitched with easy to clean Artico man-made leather, a dual like overhead lighting panel, uh, proper quality feeling steering wheel paddles, uh, velour floor mats, and intricately fashioned door cards, which feature classy panel inlays and smart double stitching. There are though areas where this EQA's premium pretensions slip a little, not only because the lower down the dash you look, the harder and cheaper the plastics become. Uh, the air vents, for example, they don't feel to the touch as great as they look to the eye. Although build quality from the German Rastat plant seems strong, with the exception of a faulty glove box catch with this test car, uh, signs of cost saving can be found when you run your fingers around the edging around the door bins or along the footwell panels of the lower center console. Uh, the freestanding center screens and the overhead lighting panel all flex when you prod them. And if you happen to have forked out well over 50,000 pounds for an upper spec version of this car, then the rather flimsy column mounted transmission stalk that it shares with a Mercedes Sprinter van may not be quite the kind of thing you'd have been expecting. What else? Uh, well, getting comfortable on the supportive seat is easy, thanks to plenty of seat and wheel adjustment. It is a pity, though, that you don't get a uh, lumbar adjustment as standard. Uh, that is only included as part of the electric seat package that you only get uh, right at the top of the range. What you don't have to pay extra for, though, is rear parking sensors or a rear parking camera, which is just as well because over-the-shoulder vision is somewhat compromised by blind spots in each rear pillar. 
Another slight irritation is the fact that Mercedes hasn't followed the lead of some rivals in providing both USB-A and USB-C ports. They're all here of the smaller USB-C variety, which for certain devices might mean that you have to use unsightly converter leads in the areas where the twin ports are provided. Uh, there are two uh, in this lovely butterfly lidded box between the seats here and in this compartment at the bottom of the center stack, which has a really nice slatted top, which slides back to reveal twin cup holders and on the plusher variants a wireless charging mat. You also get ticket clips and the sun visors, a reasonably sized glove box with an upper ledge, uh, door pockets with recesses for 500ml bottles. Uh, this overhead lighting panel lacks the sunglasses compartment which you would get in the EQB but it does incorporate buttons for the uh, emergency assistance and the SOS call features. Okay, time to take a seat in the second row. Now this is an area where this EQA simply can't replicate what's on offer with the GLA showroom stablemate. As I mentioned earlier, a huge, great half a ton battery is after all positioned directly beneath the rear bench. Again, this is a design feature you might well guess without actually knowing about it. So significant is the rise in floor height necessary to accommodate all those lithium-ion cells. The result is a bench base positioned much closer to the floor than you might be used to, uh, and that in turn means that your knees end up closer to your chest than they would usually be. A headroom will be at a bit of a premium for Taller Folk 2, uh, particularly further up the range, uh, where of course there's a panoramic glass roof fitted. A reclining seat back would help in both these regards, but you can't have that on an EQA, nor of course can this EB crossover have the sliding bench base that Mercedes engineered for continental versions of the GLA. To be fair, the raised floor height issue is something you'll only really be bothered by on longer trips. For the rest of the time, uh, folks seated back here should appreciate the fact that legroom is unaltered over a GLA, which means that someone well over six foot tall could sit behind a similarly sized front passenger and still have leg space, although it is annoying uh, that there's not all that much room to slide your feet below the base of the chair in front. If a third person has to travel in this centre here, it'll help that the bench hasn't been uh, specifically contoured for two and that the uh, transmission tunnel here isn't too high. If there are only a couple of you, you'll be able to use this uh, fold-down armrest with its pop-out cup holders. As at the front, it really does feel properly premium back here, even on this base spec variant with its smartly contoured Artico faux hide-up holstery and double white-stitched door cards. Uh, practicalities include seat back nets, uh, reasonably sized door pockets with bottle holders and coat hooks next to reading lights in the overhead grab handles. Uh, between the front seats there's a further USB-C port with an open storage area just above it, uh, just below two silver rimmed circular vents. Finally, let's take a look in the boot, accessed by a standard Easy Pack powered tailgate, which further up the range can be activated by a wave of your foot beneath the bumper if you happen to be approaching your EQA laden down with child seats and other paraphernalia. Uh, once the hatch powers up, there is, as expected, a compromise to make here, thanks to all that battery uh, underneath the floor. The GLA's 435 litre capacity figure up to parcel shelf level, it's 385 litres with the GLA plug-in hybrid, falls to 340 litres here. Still, if you load to roof level, that figure rises to 435 litres, which is probably about as much as most owners will need. You access the cargo area across this impractically silver-trimmed bumper lip, which will probably get scratched very quickly unless you're very careful. Uh, once you get your stuff in, there's not much space beneath the cargo base. Uh, disappointingly, there's not even enough underfloor room to store the charging cables. Uh, there is certainly no chance of being able to specify uh, any kind of spare wheel, for example. On the plus side, you do get a couple of netted side areas, uh, two bag hooks, an elasticated strap on the right, uh, four silver tie downs, plus the inside of the tailgate is embellished with this useful light which uh, shines white into the boot and red back to the road behind. 
And if you've specified a tow bar, which isn't always possible on an EV, the button for its electrical retraction is on the hatch in a lip. Need more room? Uh, well, Mercedes includes a flexible 40-20-40 split for the rear seat back, which means that the central part can be pushed forward for longer items like skis without disturbing a couple of rear seated passengers. Uh, pushing down the rear bench in its entirety opens up 945 litres of almost flat space up to window level or up to 1,320 litres if you low to the roof. OK, what will you pay for the first all-electric battery-powered Mercedes-Benz? Well, because this car bears the three-pointed star, you won't be surprised to hear that its price starting point is way above the level, £35,000, at which the government is prepared to offer assistance towards EV purchase these days. All the models available in the lineup use the same 66.5 kilowatt hour battery and nearly all sales are of the EQA 250 variant we're trying here, which uses a front mounted 190 horsepower electric motor and is priced from around £45,000 in this entry level sport form. From there, it's a £1,500 jump to AMG Line spec with AMG Line Premium and AMG Line Premium Plus spec variants demanding further £3,000 increments. Uh, the latter requires £52,000 from you. Uh, that's pretty much the price starting point for the two more sophisticated EQA variants, the EQA 300 formatic and the EQA 350 formatic, which add an extra electric motor onto the rear axle to increase traction. And power, the 300 variant offers 228 horsepower and the 350 boosts that to 292 horsepower. Now, because these faster models can't be had with base sport trim, prices from launch started from around £48,500 for the 300 and from around 50000 for the 350. If you like the idea of an EQA of some sort, but you need a bit of extra versatility, then bear in mind that Mercedes also has its mechanically almost identical EQB SUV for relatively little more. You might also want to consider the fact that the combustion engine version of this small SUV, the GLA, can be had in a GLA 250E plug-in hybrid form where it offers a 37-mile all-electric driving range which would be enough for most commuting journeys. After that, a 1.33-litre petrol engine cuts in with a 218-horsepower total output, 28 horsepower more than an EQA 250. The GLA 250E will save you around £4,000 over this EV Model 2, so food for thought. Uh, we'd consider both models and their likely use very carefully before deciding. If the EQA seems to be a better fit for you, then you'll probably be aware that this car has a growing band of similarly sized EV rivals and you'll want to consider what else is on offer in the segment before finally deciding. Now, as we suggested at the beginning of this section, uh, Mercedes has ignored the market for really compact and more affordable family hatch sized EVs here. As a result, this EQA is a slightly larger thing than, say, a BMW i3, a Hyundai Kona Electric, or a Kia e Nero. You could get a little nearer to what's on offer here with a bigger battery version of the Nissan Leaf, the Volkswagen ID3, and the Skoda Anyak IV. Uh, models like those are costed primarily in the 35 to 40,000 pound bracket, but those EVs aren't quite as aspirational as this Mercedes. Slightly closer to EQA territory and closer to the £40,000 price point are slightly more sophisticated compact EVs like Nissan's Aria, uh, Hyundai's Ioniq 5, Volkswagen's ID4 and Cupra's Born, all four of which are priced from just under £40,000 with comparable battery packs to that used by the EQA. For just over 40,000, you could get yourself the base standard range 75 kilowatt hour version of the Ford Mustang Mach-E. But compared to these five contenders, this Mercedes carries a frisson of extra badge equity, which will matter to potential customers. A couple of Teslas offer perhaps a slightly more premium match. Uh, EQA pricing is very similar to what the American brand will charge for the standard range plus and the long range versions of its popular Model 3, but that's the saloon of course. 
for a little less, but not much less, you can get the Tesla Model Y, which is a five-door hatch SUV and therefore more closely comparable to this Mercedes. For under £45,000, that's the EQA's starting price point, you could probably get a long-range, large battery Model Y and perhaps even equip it with the unique in-segment option of seven seats. In the 40 to 50,000 pound bracket where nearly all EQA sales will reside, you could also consider premium segment mid-sized EV contenders like the Volvo XC40 Recharge Pure Electric, uh, the Kia EV6, the Audi Q4 Sportback e-tron and our current favourite, the Polestar 2. Uh, the Lexus UX300e also sits in this price segment, but that's not so tempting because its 54.3 kilowatt hour battery will only take you up to 186 miles. A BMW i4 starts at just over 50,000, and if you can push your budget up to around 60,000 pounds, well, you could also consider the BMW iX3, which has an 80 kilowatt hour battery. But that car's really more directly comparable to the bigger Mercedes EQC, which competes against larger EVs like Jaguar's I-Pace and Audi's e-tron Sportback in the 65 to 70,000 pound bracket. If having considered all that, you conclude it is an EQA that you really want, then you're gonna to need to know exactly how generous Mercedes has been with standard kit. So let's take a look at that now. Now here we've got the base EQA 250 Sport model, which comes as standard with 18 inch five spoke alloy wheels, uh, LED high performance headlights with adaptive high beam assist, uh, privacy glass, polished aluminium roof rails, an easy pack powered tailgate. Uh, you also get branded puddle lights and a parking package too with a reversing camera. Uh, there's also cruise control with active speed limit assist and that can adapt your speed to the prevailing limit. Uh, inside with base sport trim, you get a multifunction sport steering wheel, which is uh, trimmed in stitched leather, a thermotronic automatic climate control, an auto dimming rear view mirror, uh, velour floor mats and ambient lighting with a choice of 64 colors. And there's also a seat comfort package. Now this has electro pneumatic four-way lumbar support for heated front seats that are trimmed in black or beige man-made Artico leather. The driving stuff's quite interesting. So the usual Mercedes Dynamic Select driving mode system with eco, comfort and sport modes. But in this case, it's been embellished with a brake recuperation setup that's activated by paddles behind the steering wheel. Uh, now this defaults to a D auto setting, which makes all the decisions for you. Or you can vary the level of brake regeneration through four levels. D plus for coasting, then D, low recuperation, D minus, medium recuperation, and D minus minus, high recuperation. In other words, you'll not want for drive settings. Media connectivity across the range is taken care of by the brand's MBUX multimedia system with widescreen cockpit, uh, two 10-inch digital displays with touch pads. Uh, the central screen incorporates Bluetooth, a 225-watt DAB tuner, and smartphone integration, including Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, plus hard disk navigation with what Mercedes calls electric intelligence. Now, this setup always calculates the route that will get you to your destination fastest, uh, uh, taking into account the charging times and allowing for route topography, traffic conditions and the weather. Uh, the MBUX system also includes a very good voice control setup and that's activated by the phrase, Hey Mercedes. Every EQA model comes as standard with a three-year subscription to the Mercedes Me Connect vehicle monitoring package and that works via a free app. Now this can allow you to set charging times and activate timings for the car's pre-entry climate control system. Plus, as with all larger Mercedes models, it reminds you when a service is due and it can automatically detect and share with you details on your car's wear and tear items. In addition, the app includes a parked vehicle locator. It gives you a one-touch button for fast accident and breakdown recovery, and it will automatically alert the rescue services in the event of an accident. It can even track your EQA if it's stolen. It'll tell you if it's left a pre-agreed geographical boundary if you lend it out. And it can tell you where the vehicle is if you've gone and forgotten where you parked it. 
as usual with an EV, there's single speed automatic transmission. The 66.5 kilowatt hour battery comes paired to an 11 kilowatt AC onboard charger and a 100 kilowatt DC onboard charger. And you get a couple of five meter charging cables, a mode two lead for plugging into a conventional socket and a mode three cable for use with wall boxes and AC public charging points of up to 11 kilowatts. A year's subscription to the Ionity rapid charging network also comes included in the price. Want a little more than that? Well, almost all EQA customers will, in which case they'll be selecting some sort of AMG line spec model. Uh, AMG line uh, is probably most people's range starting point, and from this level in the range, your EQA will look a lot plusher thanks to the chromed twin blade design on the front grille panel, AMG line body styling, which gives you smarter front and rear aprons, and classier AMG wheels, which remain at 18 inches in size with AMG line trim. The cabin's lifted over Sport Spec 2 with AMG Sport seats, red upholstery stitching with part Dynamica microfiber trim, aluminium trim inlays, a Nappa leather trimmed sport steering wheel, uh, brushed stainless steel sports pedals, uh, branded aluminum door sills and AMG floor mats. AMG Line Premium is the next level up which gives you bigger 19 inch AMG wheels, a sliding panoramic glass roof, keyless go keyless entry, a 10 speaker 225 watt advanced sound system and a wireless charging mat. There's also a navigation setup embellished with the brand's clever augmented reality system. This is effectively a live camera feed of the road ahead overlaid with house numbers, road names, direction arrows and other useful bits of information that'll help you to find your way. All the real niceties though are reserved for the top of the range AMG line premium plus spec and that's recognizable by the largest size 20 inch wheels and it's the only variant that comes with the brand's adaptive damping system. AMG line premium plus also gets you a 360 degree surround view parking camera, a head up display, gesture control for the MBUX infotainment system and a 12 speaker 590 watt Burmester sound system. Right, that covers off the standard stuff. I uh, hope you've been paying attention if you're an EQA customer who wants an individual specification because there aren't many options. So if you want more kit, you have no choice but to move up a spec level. You can add in a tow bar. That's not always possible on an EV, although you'll probably only want to do that if you've gone for one of the formatic models because with those, uh, the rather feeble 750 kilo brake towing weight of the ordinary EQA 250 rises substantially to 1,800 kilos. You'll probably also need to pay more for your choice of paintwork because there's only one standard shade, that solid night black. Otherwise, you'll need to pay more for one of the metallic colors. We have mountain gray here. As usual though, Mercedes offers its deeply lustrous mountain gray magno shade for those who just don't care how much they spend on paintwork. On to safety, uh, this car's MFA2 platform was one of the first to be engineered by Mercedes at the brand's technology center for vehicle safety in Sindelfingen, which develops vehicle structures based on findings from research into real accidents. Now, every single body shell component of this model was developed according to the loads and stresses encountered in real world crashes with respect to uh, material thickness, sheet steel quality and joining technology. And of course, this EQA includes all the usual camera driven kit. As standard, you get active brake assist autonomous braking. That's one of those setups that scans the road ahead as you drive, warns you of potential accident hazards, and is also capable of autonomously braking the car if you don't respond to the warnings or perhaps you aren't able to. Uh, testing has indicated that this whole setup will eradicate 20% of nose to tail accidents and decrease their severity in a further 25% of cases. Active lane keeping assist is also standard across the EQA range and that's able not only to warn you if you drift across lane markings but it's also capable of applying subtle steering lock to ease the car back to where it ought to be. In addition, Mercedes includes another important camera safety feature, attention assist, and this monitors your driving reactions to detect drowsiness. 
There's speed limit assist, which detects the speed limit and displays it in the instrument cluster, along with traffic sign assist, which uses a camera to scan speed limit signs, so navigation data always displays the current limit. And, as I mentioned earlier, the multi-beam LED headlamp system includes adaptive high beam assist to automatically dip your headlights for you at night in the face of oncoming traffic. Uh, plus, the Mercedes Me Connect app, uh, another thing that we mentioned earlier on, that includes an e-call emergency call system which will automatically alert the emergency services to your exact location if the airbags go off in an accident. More familiar standard safety stuff includes ABS brakes, which automatically prime themselves in wet weather, and flash the rear lights in emergency stops to warn following motorists. Plus, there's an ESP stability control system with acceleration skid control and curve dynamic assist for extra cornering traction. If all that's not enough to keep you out of the hedge, uh, there are also twin front side and curtain airbags, plus there's a driver's knee bag, uh, there are anti-whiplash head restraints, ice fixed child seat fastenings, a deformable steering column, uh, crash responsive emergency lighting, and a pedestrian friendly bonnet too. Plus you get a tire pressure monitoring system, and there's also hill start assist to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions. If you want to go further and get some of the choicest elements of Mercedes camera driven safety tech, you'll be offered the chance to spend around £1,500 more uh, to get the brand's driving assistance package, which includes a package of key extra camera safety features, uh, amongst which are elements which also give this car limited autonomous driving capability. So let's talk you through it all. The driving assistance package starts with active blind spot assist, which can warn you of vehicles in your blind spot during a lane change and can help to avoid a collision by means of one-sided braking intervention. It includes an exit warning function too, which alerts passengers if they're just about to open their doors in the face of oncoming traffic. Uh, there is braking stuff too, of course. The active brake assist with cross traffic function feature, uh, that can help to avoid accidents with vehicles ahead, with crossing traffic, and also with pedestrians and or mitigate their consequences. And there's active emergency stop assist, which initiates immediate emergency braking if evasion is important possible. There's also an evasive steering assist which can support you in making evasive maneuvers if a pedestrian or a cyclist suddenly appears in your path. And there's a pedestrian warning function which activates near pedestrian crossings. Plus you also get a clever route based speed adjustment feature. Now that works with GPS data to automatically adapt your speed before curves, roundabouts and junctions. Uh, as we mentioned, the driving assistance package also includes limited autonomous driving capability to suit the mood of the moment. Uh, that comes courtesy of the pack's active distance assist distronic system, which is designed to operate on a dual carriageway and works with the Mercedes active steering assist setup. Now the distronic uh, feature is basically a super advanced adaptive cruise control, which automatically regulates your distance to the car in front and which can, if necessary, remotely slow the car with up to 50% of stopping power. It also works the active speed limit assist feature we mentioned earlier on, which automatically sets the cruise control to speed limit signs as you pass them. Uh, finally, active steering assist keeps you in the center of your designated lane, and it will, if needed, apply some subtle steering correction to ease you back to where you should be. It's all very reassuring. The elephant in the room here is driving range. This EQA 250 model's driving range figure, rated between 250 and 263 miles, depending on conditions, really isn't that much more than you get from a Renault Zoe Super Mini EV from the next class down. Surprisingly, this range reading doesn't really vary much with the Formatic EQA 300 and EQA 350 variants, which troll around with an extra electric motor on their rear axles. Uh, there it's 255 to 264 miles. You'll need some class perspective here, which delivers the news that with the exception of the Lexus UX300e, 
all the comparably priced rivals in this size and price bracket can do better. Now to save you looking all this up, we'll reel off the list for you. And it begins with the Ford Mustang Mach-E in its uh, standard range rear driven form. Uh, that's a 75 kilowatt hour one, 273 miles. A Tesla Model 3 standard range plus saloon, 278 miles. A Tesla Model Y performance dual motor hatch, 280 miles. A Hyundai Ioniq 5, 73 kilowatt hour, uh, that's 300 miles. Volkswagen's ID4, the 77 kilowatt hour version, 310 miles. A Kia EV6, 77 kilowatt hours again, 316 miles. An Audi Q4 40 e-tron, uh, 317 miles. The Polestar 2 long range standard motor, 335 miles. And the Cupra Born, 77 kilowatt hours, also 335 miles. The kicker is that all of those EVs begin with starting prices lower than this Mercedes. In fact, for the cost of a really plush EQA, you could even get a BMW i4 eDrive 40 with a 367 mile range. Part of the issue here is weight, and partly that's because this car, as we've been saying all the way through this test, isn't based around underpinnings which were ever really designed for an electric car. The MFA2 platform that was borrowed from combustion engine Mercedes compact models, uh, which it uses instead, had to have all kinds of strengthening structures welded into it to cope with the 66.5 kilowatt hour battery packs, 480 kilo weight. That explains why uh, what seems like quite a compact little car actually weighs well over two tons, about 200 kilos more than say an Audi Q4 e-tron or a Tesla Model 3. It can't only be that though, because a Polestar 2, for example, our current favorite in this segment, uh, weighs 83 kilos more. Clearly, ultimate range depends on a real depth of EV engineering that uh, to some extent, this Mercedes just doesn't have. Perhaps that is a touch unfair. We should after all mention that at the time of this test, in autumn 2021, the brand told us it was planning to add a 500 kilometer variant to the lineup. And uh, such a driving range increase to 310 miles would certainly, uh, presumably, at a price, bring this EQA closer to the top class standard. It's also true that beyond battery cell development, there are some aspects of electrified engineering here that rivals could learn something from. The variable brake regeneration system, for example, which is absolutely the best we've tried. It offers a D auto setting, which makes all the decisions for you, or it allows you to vary the level of brake regeneration through four levels. D plus for coasting, uh, then D, low recuperation, D minus, medium recuperation, and D minus minus, high recuperation. Uh, there's also the electric intelligence embellished navigation system. Now this takes uh, charging locations, charging times, route topography, uh, traffic conditions, and the weather all into account when it's planning your optimum route. If only it could tell you whether a charger was occupied and book a space for you at the time that you'll need it, then the system would be absolutely perfect. But of course it can't do that because the current global charging network isn't that sophisticated. And in the UK it isn't even that comprehensive given the flood of EVs taken to the roads and expecting to plug in. Uh, Mercedes claims to offer the world's biggest charging network. Uh, they have over 450,000 AC and DC charging points, 175,000 of those in Europe, but that's in Europe. Still, a three-year subscription to the Mercedes Me Charge public charging network that comes as standard with this car. And the EQA's EQ menu charging option screen is very good at searching out charging points for you with those in the Mercedes Me network offset with green power. Uh, the EQA has the usual 11 kilowatt AC charging capability, but it can't offer the 150 kilowatt DC onboard charger that you'll find with some rivals like the Ford Mustang Mach-E and the Polestar 2. Instead, it uses a lesser 100 kilowatt onboard charger, which connected to a 100 kilowatt public charger will allow the car to charge from 10 to 80 percent in 37 minutes. Mind you, that's only around five minutes less than rivals with 150 kilowatt onboard DC chargers can manage. Uh, more commonly, of course, you'll be powering up from a wall box that you'll need to install in your garage. If that wall box is of the 7.4 kilowatt sort, uh, charging to 100% takes 10 hours and 45 minutes. If you install an 11 kilowatt wall box, it'll take just over seven hours.
Using that centre display's EQ menus charging options screen, uh, you can set a departure time for when you'll next need the car so that charging is potentially delayed to coincide with cheaper night rate electricity. And you can also manage your charging program uh, either via the screen or by using the Mercedes Me Connect app and that can allow you to precondition the cabin so that you won't have to waste loads of energy using the climate fan when you first set off. Uh, the EQ menu has a consumption section too, which allows you to monitor overall energy consumption in miles per kilowatt hour, with an average from start reading and a percentage drain from driving, heating and cooling and uh, other consumers. Uh, there is also a selectable graphical screen and that can show you the car's consumption and its energy recuperation over different time periods, uh, 7.5, 30 or 90 minutes or the last three hours. The EQ menu also includes a pleasingly detailed energy flow display with a battery percentage readout. Uh, the display glows blue off throttle and red when you're using energy. What else? Well, the fact that Mercedes has optimized aerodynamics using special front and rear aprons, an enclosed underbody, uh, specially adapted front and rear spoilers, and specially optimized aero wheels obviously maximizes range. As a result, uh, this car has a relatively slippery drag factor of 0.28 CD. Uh, the fact that the brand standardizes a heat pump for this car, uh, that's a pricey option with many rivals, also helps uh, this forms part of a sophisticated thermal management system. The heat pump compresses refrigerant under high pressure, creating heat that warms up the flowing air through the ventilation system. Uh, the climate setup then needs less energy from the battery in colder weather. Now all of this helps to explain why this car gets a little closer to the range that's promised by its dashboard indicator than some of its rivals that we've tried. We have regularly got range figures well over 200 miles throughout this test, even in chilly weather. On to issues of tax, uh, because of the 0% CO2 figure, there's no first year road tax to pay and you won't even be saddled with inner city congestion charges. More significantly, your company benefit in kind tax rating will be pitched at Group 1, which uh, means at the time of this test, uh, an annual payment of around £162 for higher rate earners or £81 for lower rated earners. But that is still massively less than such people would need to fork out for a comparable combustion engine Mercedes GLA. Uh, one of those is rated at BIK Group 32 for a base diesel GLA or 35 for a base petrol. GLA. Service intervals are every year or 15,000 miles. Uh, fixed price servicing is available across the EQA range and most buyers opt for the Mercedes Service Care Plan and that's based either on a two service, two year deal, uh, three years with three services or four years with four services. Whatever package you opt for, it'll cover the cost of all recommended service items like brake fluid, air filters and screen wash. Uh, brake pads too, although you'll hardly ever have to replace those in an EQA thanks to the brake regeneration system. Uh, it's also worth noting that the standard Mercedes Me Connect Services package that includes remote self-diagnostic capability and that enables your EQA to monitor wear and tear items and alert your local dealer to let you know if something needs seeing to. Uh, you'll get a message both on the dashboard and also via your Mercedes Me app that reminds you when a service is due. As for ownership peace of mind, well, you're limited to the usual unremarkable three-year, 60,000-mile deal that Mercedes offers. Uh, you can extend it to five years at extra cost, but you shouldn't have to. Insurance groupings, as usual, with an EV are unreasonably high. They range between 42 and 44 for the EQA 250, it's group 46 for the EQA 300 formatic, and it's group 47 or 48 for the EQA 350 formatic. Finally, residual values, uh, as with any Mercedes, they should be strong. We can expect this EQA to at least replicate the showing of its GLA combustion stablemate. Uh, that returns up to 55% of the original purchase price back after three years and 36,000 miles. Indeed, it might actually do a bit better than that. The next model up in the EQ range, the EQC, uh, returns up to 58% over the same period.
There's lots you might like about the EQA. It is, after all, a very Mercedes-style package with a feeling of cabin elegance, sophistication and quality that many competitors struggle to match. And the compromises that the battery system requires in terms of uh, both rear seat accommodation and boot space aren't too great. The brake regeneration system, that's excellent. Uh, the extensive Mercedes Me charging network and the easy way that you can pay to use that is an obvious attraction too. And residual values will probably be very competitive. If you can use all of those attributes to justify a car that costs slightly more than its obvious rivals and goes a slightly lower distance than them between charges, then all well and good. If you can't, then lots of alternatives in this segment await your evaluation. Once you've tried them though, you might end up feeling that none have quite the class and the appeal of an EQA, such as the draw of the three-pointed star. We are a little disappointed that Mercedes chose to patch together an electric family car from the engineering of a combustion-powered one, but not everyone cares about design semantics of this sort. And for the kind of people that an EQA is aimed at, uh, what's been delivered here will probably be sufficient to satisfy. We always thought though that the Mercedes mantra was the best or nothing, which means that in this case, the best is clearly yet to come. <laughs>